evening and welcome to Personal Finance. I'm Kukule Tukele. Now, there are two types of employment, permanent and contract, each with their own implications for your tax. This evening, Pit Now, Project Director at the South African Institute of Chartered Accountants, joins me now for a look at the tax implication for contract employees. Always good to have you with us, Pit. And maybe mm. uh, we need to get through that definition first regarding the full-time employees as well as an independent contractor. I take it that's someone who, uh, as the word stipulates itself, uh, isn't someone who has a full-time employment with a particular uh, firm. Yeah, that's right. I mean, legally, an employee is a person that makes his or her time available. So you'll come in in the morning at 8 and leave at 5 and get paid for it. If you do any work or not, you'll get paid. Mm -hmm. An independent contractor makes the result of the work, so the product. So you sell your service. So you actually do a consulting service and, and you get paid for what you've done. So you paid not so much for the time that you make available, although you also render, or render your, your time, but you actually pay it for what you deliver. And these, obviously, these services vary from, you know, different kind of service offerings, and you can do it at the same time uh, as completing your full-time employment as well? Yes, yes. There's nothing preventing a person from that, uh, unless your employer has a contract that, 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 that prohibits you from entering into other Mm. Um, uh, rendering other services, particularly to, to competitors or other people like that. But there's nothing in law that prevents a person from taking up full-time employment and then also doing some independent work on the side. Let's get to the numbers here, because clearly it's all about mm. the money. Mm. If you are an independent contractor, who does the onus lie on to uh, pay taxes to SARS? Is it on the person that uh, is rendering the service, the independent contractor themselves, or the person who is receiving the service? Yeah, um, it, it lies on basically on the person. All, all taxes actually lie on the person that is re uh, receiving the money or rendering the service in this instance. But because it's so uh, difficult... Maybe, and there was a lot of tax avoidance in, in, in the past in this. People were sort of covering a thing and saying this is an independent contract and it really was an employment contract. Mm. Um, that, that, that the tax law deems a person to be an employee under certain instances and that is where you work at the premises of the person where you render the services. So you go to their premises and you are under their control, either with regard to your time, so you must start at 8 o'clock and leave at 5 o'clock, or the quality of your work. So a, a true independent person is a person that, that has his own facilities or her own facilities, render the work, and, and just being paid for, for the work that they've done. Would that kind of information have to be disclosed to SARS? That then? is, yeah, yeah, it would be. Yeah. The employer actually in that, that instance bears the onus to determine if this is a true independent employee contract. Oh. And, and if, if it is, then they don't deduct any tax. You will invoice them for the work that you've done and they will pay you that without any taxes. And as I say, that's your responsibility then as a contractor, mm. if we can call that person that, to, to pay the taxes. If, you're an em if that's sort of a, let's call it a quasi-employment contract, they will deduct 25%. And Let's get to that figure yeah. because it does seem as though 25% is often the number that gets thrown around mm, when mm. Uh, uh, people take up this kind of contract yeah. work. Is that the be all and end all or are there other uh, variables, especially given the, the sum of the money that yes. the contractor yeah, might and, receive? And 25% is certainly high. If, you, if we look at the 2016 tax rates, at 180,000 rand is where we start leaving the 18% tax bracket. So there your maximum tax is 18%, but when you bring your rebate in, even at a total income of 180,000 rand, you're only paying 10% tax. So, so the 25% would be harsh. And, and the, uh, the law allows for you to go to SARS and get a tax directive that they also always talk about. So you'll go Tell to SARS. Yeah. So you'll go to SARS and say, listen, my income for the year, I expect to only get 180,000 rand. I have some expenses. I need to commute. I need a car. I need a computer to do my work. So this is what I expect my taxable income will be, and they will then give you a rate of tax to the employer, which would not be the 25%. Which would be something which is in line with the It would be in line with that. They normally would give an 18%, so that's sort of the lowest that they can go down to, but you can convince them to give a lower rate as well. With that tax directive, bit, how does it link up with being a provisional taxpayer? Because that's also a phrase we yeah, hear about yeah. so often. If I think it's easy, or in simple terms to say, if you pay employees tax, then you generally won't be a provisional taxpayer unless you earn investment income. So provisional tax is there for, for the government to get the money earlier and not wait for the assessment. And it's, it's paid twice annually, so in August and February for individuals every year. Mm. And it is for any person then that doesn't earn remuneration. Um, so it would include professional fees, independent contracting fees, but also investment income. A capital gain, for instance, if you make a capital gain, wouldn't make you a provisional taxpayer. 
But anything other than remuneration, and one can say remuneration subject to employees tax or PAYE, um, would make you a provisional taxpayer. Clearly provisional tax sounds as though it's a lot more complicated because you need to draw up assumptions as to how much you think you might mm. earn and then yeah. you actually calculate that according to how much you actually earn. Wouldn't it be just easier to get uh, professional tax advice there or can individuals go at it alone? Well, I think it is complex and I think um, there's another reason why you would want to, so, so you can do it on your own, but the, there's a reason why I think you must go to professional if you have provisional tax. Clearly your income would be fluctuating. A, an employment contract would give you a fixed income, so it's easy to predict what your year would be. An independent contractor would fluctuate. You would have one month a good month, and next month might not be that good. So mm. it, it is more difficult to calculate the tax. But there are, there are underestimation penalties, because as you say, you're estimating your income for the year. If you get it wrong and you're below a million rand, you're not within 90% accurate, or over a million rand, you have an 80% or a 20% margin, then there's a 20% penalty, mm. which is very harsh. Yeah, so, and that, that is why I would suggest that if you're a provisional taxpayer, it is prudent to go to a tax con consultant to get some advice there. Before we make a lot of people who are watching the show tonight very mm. nervous, uh, how do you determine, as you, you touched on it briefly, but to be a contract employee doesn't necessarily mean that you are a provisional taxpayer? Or would uh, one need to uh, get uh, that kind of assessment from SARS? No, no, well, you can get that assessment from SARS, but I think it's, 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 it's really easy to determine itself. So if you say that the basic rule is if, I'm, if I get income that is subject to employee's tax, so that my employer deducts, then I don't have to worry about provisional tax. I generally would be fine. If I get income that is not subject to tax, then I would say I would now be. So it's anything other than remuneration that's you're basically saying. So salary, wages, etc., would have employee's tax consequences. Any other professional fees, commission, for instance, mm. would, would make me a provisional taxpayer. But then I'm exempt from paying provisional tax if my income is below the tax threshold. So if my total income for the year is only 79,000 Rand, which is what we're currently sitting at, then I don't have to register as a provisional. Well, I can register, but I don't have to make any payments. Sure. But clearly, if I'm over that, then I will have to make, make that provisional tax payment. Okay, we've got that covered. Let's go back to the contract employee here. You mentioned that you can't get the tax directive uh, to only be charged about mm. 18, can go as low as about 10%. Is 25 that uh, threshold that uh, is the highest, or are there other levels between that 18 to 25%? No, at the moment, the 25 is is the highest. That they, that um, So SARS would, wouldn't generally... Yeah, you wouldn't go and ask for more than 25% deduction. You can yeah. voluntarily make, but that's only in the employment environment where they allow for that. Because, you know, this is knocked off on your gross income. Mm -hmm. So if you've got expenses, then of course, the 25 that's why I say the 25% would be high. Um, the, there are 28 percent, but they apply to companies. So when you render your services not in your individual name, but through a company, then they would deduct 28 percent if it's a personal services provider. Mm. Speaking yeah. about the payment, does the payment need to be made to SARS at the end of your tax year, or is it advisable for South African contractors to actually put a certain section of that money away or make the contributions to SARS monthly? Yeah, um, it is advisable to put the money away, to save for it, because I think a lot of people that do contract work, sort of taxes are lasting, they, 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 they want to get the work and want to do the work, and then they don't worry about the taxes. Mm. Um, if you have a monthly deduction as an employee, then it's the, the biannual thing. So every six months you'll pay your taxes, so you'll have to save for that to pay that. Then you put your return in after the year end, which is normally June, July, and get assessed. And if there's a shortfall, you'll pay that in. If, it's an, if you've overpaid in provisional tax, they'll refund you. So yeah, you must save for that. And uh, as an independent, you'll only pay tax twice a year then. Sure, we're making things very difficult, aren't we here, yeah, Pete? Because yeah. we know South Africans don't have a culture of saving. But you also mentioned details that need to be submitted to SARS when it mm. comes to being an independent contractor. Other than the kind of employment that you undertake and the uh, full disclosure of the money that you actually make, uh, what further details need to be well, submitted? Well, first of all, any person that earns any an amount of income must register with SARS. And that would require that they have your contact detail, your addresses, your email addresses and telephone numbers to be able to get hold of you. And then if you're a provisional taxpayer, of course, every six months, the onus is on you to ask for the provisional return. Mm. Now, if you do it electronically, it's easy, but you actually have to advise them that I'm a provisional taxpayer, so I'm not subject to employee's tax, I have to pay every six months. You'll call up that, that return and submit it every six months. And then, of course, you'll put in, as you say, your, your year-end return for the full year, which you declare and give that in income. But also very important is that, and, and this has become very common, so I call it a review of the return. So when you submit a return, they see you've got 
a million rand income and you've got 200,000 rand expenses. And mm. then they would want to know whether that's, those are valid expenses. They seldom ask about the income side. Uh. <laughs> but then, of course, you will have to retain their documents to support any entry that you make in your tax return. So that is information that SARS, as a rule, ask for. And then, of course, if you go for the tax directive, you'll have to give them the details of what your expected income is, expected expenses, so that they can make a call on what, what um, tax rate your employer must then withhold. Mm -hmm. Time now for us to recap on the takeaways from this key discussion. Pitt, we've said quite a bit, and mm. I hope the viewers aren't confused, but if we could demystify it for contract employees, the t key takeaway points from this yeah, uh, I think conversation. The, the first point is that to, to make absolutely certain that it's not a contract of employment, but a, an independent contractor, in, in the sense that you will then asking by way of an invoice and being paid for that, you then have the ob ob obligation to pay your provisional taxes to register with SARS to pay those taxes on, on a bi-monthly basis. And if you then claim any deductions, et cetera, you have the obligation to retain the documents to support those deductions. Mm -hmm. Just to throw in an example, just for argument's mm -hmm. sake, let's just say there's someone out there who works at a medical center earning about 20,000 Rand a month. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the initial steps that they need to take, uh, as you mentioned, make the payments biannually and put money aside, I take it? Yes, yeah. But let's just confirm that when you say work at, at a medical center, um, because that is at the premises of an employer, they mm -hmm. still work as an independent. So they are being paid, let's say, on a commission basis for what they sell or the, the work that they turn out. Yes, they would have to, to put money away, um, put in register with SARS to make those provisional tax payments, and then finally put in the tax return after the end of the year. Exactly, and obviously maybe try to get a tax director from SARS then, which if to make things Because at 20,000 Rand, you would be, you know, you would not, even if you have no expenses, you will not be at the 25% tax rate. So yeah, the 25% would be harsh in that instance. Mm. So you definitely would have to ask for, a, for a, a lower tax rate. I think the easiest way out is actually to speak to SARS first to get the tax directive yes. uh, for anybody who might be watching this yeah, evening. Yeah, but yeah. thank you so much for your time today. That was, uh, uh, that's where we leave it rather for personal finance tonight. A big thank you once more to Pit Nell, Project Director at the South African Institute of Chartered Accountants. Remember that we want to hear from you, so send us your feedback and your insights. You can tweet any of your comments to at CNBC Africa using the hashtag finance410 or to myself at Gukumfupi. Until next time, it's goodbye for now. Thank you.